He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered and the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. We are in Habakkuk chapter 3 this morning considering verse 6. Not only is the power of God glorious back in verse 4 or fierce in verse 5, but God's power is everlasting. And we're going to be considering that this morning as we think through our own lives and what we face even through this corona crisis period. This is our devotion 21 from Habakkuk. And we look this morning at the power of God that is everlasting, everlasting power. What God does and who God is, is everlasting and has everlasting effects. But this verse also shows the way in which the judgments of the Lord embraces the whole earth as the earth has earthquakes and nature itself longs for the day of redemption, as sin has caused the very world to suffer. Creation itself has been subjected and plunged into the curse because of the sin of man. No longer did earth yield the kind of fruit and crops that it would. It would be by toil and suffering that we would eat. No longer would the lion lie down with the lamb or eat grain, but it would eat the sheep. And at God's fierce power, even the earth quakes. That's the response that the earth has to the power of God. How much more should our response be of quaking before him? And that which we would look at and say, well, that is eternal. That was there when my great grandfather was there or my grandfather was there or my father was there. How much does that that even is eternal shown in the light of the eternality of God to be that which is but a moment? Romans 8 verse 22 to 23 says this. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we join as Christians with creation groaning. Who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. What is emphasized in our section, though, is the way in which God crushes that which we seem to see as eternal or everlasting. And he shows himself indeed as the only one that really is everlasting. And the earth, this earth that we know will one day pass away. But the word of the Lord will remain forever. And I believe that there is a theological, eschatological hint even in this one verse this morning. Because there will come a day when Jesus returns to this earth at the beginning of his earthly thousand year reign. Where where he reigns from Jerusalem and where he lifts Jerusalem up. As a great diadem on a ring and all other mountains and in the surrounding area are made low. Look with me, if you will, at Zechariah 14, verse 3 to 11. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall be splitting too from east to west by the very wide, a very wide valley so that one half of the Mount shall move northward and one other half shall move southward and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azul and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the day of days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. 
On that day there shall be no light, cold or frost, and there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but an evening time, at an evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer and in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon south of Jerusalem. This is the point that I'm making is that there will be a day where those everlasting hills that have formed the landscape of Israel will be made low. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses and it shall be inhabited. For there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. This has not yet happened. Even now, as Jerusalem occupies the land that it has since 1948, it has never dwelt in this kind of a setting of verse 11 of, of Zechariah 14. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Even recently in the news, we find rockets that are being shot into Jerusalem. In our passage in Habakkuk verse 5, the verse that we looked or we looked at yesterday, we saw the ferocious power of God speaking about pestilence and plague. And in, Zechari and, and in um, Zechariah 14, we also see Zechariah 14 from verse 12, the, the verse after what we've just read. We also see a plague spoken about. Go read that section, if you will, about the day that Jesus returns. He absolutely crushes the armies of the world who raise themselves up against Jerusalem. He rescues his people and he sets up his earthly reign and he will reign from David's throne. I'm really not sure how many, how, how it is that so many theologians miss this. There is no place that speaks of Jesus on his throne at this moment. Look for it, you won't find it. He is indeed seated at the right hand of God. When we speak about the Lord reigns from his throne, I hope you mean the Lord Yahweh, not the Lord Jesus, because Jesus will still sit upon the throne of King David. There are prophecies referring to Jesus' second coming where he will reign. But at this time, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Father is indeed sovereignly ruling over all things. Even the devil is God's devil, as the phrase has often been used. But at this moment, our Lord Jesus' role and his work currently is a media mediatory work. It is an intercessory work for his church. He is not yet ruling from the throne of his father, David. And I wonder how somebody would cope in times like this, going through the corona crisis on earth with an eschatology that says that Jesus reigns from his throne and we rule with him spiritually. How do you cope with that? When you see that you do not have the authority over the government authorities, when you do not have the authority over what WHO says or what they prescribe or vaccines that might be rolled out, how do you deal with that kind of a theology? The reality, dear one, is that our hope is that Christ will return, that he will make all things right and that he will make all things new. His current role is mediating between us and God and interceding for us before God. And the Holy Spirit within us is also interceding for us. Two thirds of the Holy Trinity given to intercession makes you wonder, dear church, should we not be praying more? Doing that which God is himself committing himself to in a time like this? If he was simply ruling and we were reigning with him, as many theologians wrongly state, as they look at the second coming prophecies of, of 
Christ's second coming and they, they look at it in an allegorical way. Yet they'd interpret his first coming prophecies in a literal way. But now they suddenly move to this spiritual understanding of his second coming. How do you deal then with the things that face us in this world? Part of the prophecy, even here in Habakkuk, is speaking of the everlasting power of God. And there's a prophetic hint of the fact that these things that we look around us and think, this is eternal, that's eternal. Those things will be shown to not be eternal in the light of the everlasting aspect of who God is. When is this day coming? When he will lay the nations low and the hills low? Someday soon. He is the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Listen to the prayer of Moses, which also highlights this truth for us about the power of God. This is Psalm 90, and you can turn there in your Bibles, and we'll read through that from verse 1 to 17. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth. Notice that, before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Or as the watch in the night, you sweep them away with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. I believe there's a prophetic hint even in this prayer of Moses. Because there's a group of, of the nations that are swept away at the second coming of Christ. And at the end of that thousand years, what happens? They've rejuvenated and Satan is released and he deceives the nations once more. And again, they are swept away. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. Verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring out our years to an end like a sigh. <sighs> The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days. What a wonderful section in this passage. Go and read the rest of that. And you see the everlasting power of God. We ought to be those that live in the light of the fact that our God is from everlasting through to everlasting. There's a level of accountability which we have before him because we will give an account. There's a level of brevity because this life will soon be over. There's a level of dependency. And even at the end of that Psalm, Psalm 90, it says, establish the work of our hands. There is a responsibility underneath the sovereignty of God. But dear one, consider this morning the everlasting power of God. The one who is from everlasting through to everlasting. What trials in your life are everlasting trials? And let me tell you one everlasting problem that mankind has. The greatest problem that any human being will ever have. It is not economic. It is not a health issue like the coronavirus. It is not family issues. It is not cultural issues. It is not the past of apartheid or of colonialism or the way that we have been unjust to one another throughout the ages as mankind. The biggest problem that mankind has is a God problem. That's the biggest problem that we have. It is an everlasting 
problem. And it is only him who is everlasting and risen from the grave. God himself incarnate, our Lord Jesus Christ, who can solve the everlasting problem that you and I have with God because of our sin. We are those that need to be laid low as well before God in humility and call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. We need to be those that because of the everlasting nature of who God is, turn to him for the everlasting forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ alone. All of those nations that rage against him, Psalm 2, will be laid low. Let us not be those that reject the free offer that we are given in our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the Father is everlasting, so is his love. His love is everlasting and poured out to us and to our own hearts through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only by Jesus, by his perfect work, by his perfect person, that we are able to enter into everlasting life. Dear one, what trial is it that you're facing? What is it that is causing you to possibly question God or do something similar to what Habakkuk was doing with his two complaints? When we consider the everlasting nature of who God is and his tremendous power, may we continue to take great comfort to live today for his glory. As we think about the fact that he is already in tomorrow, it gives you and I strength to live today in a way that he will be glorified. May God bless his word to your own heart as we consider the everlasting power of God. Amen.